This is the reality. Hello to you, my name's Dudley Anderson, so good to be with you once again on The Reality. Let me just say that I appreciate comments very much indeed. If you've got a story to tell, perhaps we can chat together. Please drop it to me by email, dudley at surereality.net. I'd love to hear from you. Today on The Reality, we're featuring the Reality Bible Special with Pastor Peter Jenkins. Today we're asking the question, what is the church? The Church of Jesus Christ was implemented almost 2,000 years ago. God loved the world so much that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to usher in the Kingdom of God. Jesus, as God incarnate, lived a perfect life, conforming to the whole law of Moses. He was guiltless. But God, in His grace and His love for all mankind, imputed our sin upon Jesus on the cross of Calvary, so that, by faith in Him and confessing Christ as Lord, we might be forgiven of our sins and be imputed with God's own righteousness, thus ushering in the kingdom of God. If I was to carry out a survey, nearly every time the answer comes back, it's a building. The Bible defines the church as a body. This is a question that needs to be asked now. Everybody listening Mm -hmm. suddenly switch around now from looking externally at a church, Mm -hmm. looking internally at the church. So your body is the church because the Holy Spirit has made your body his temple. (laughs) Now, if the Holy Spirit is living inside you and Christ is the head of your life, guess what? You are a walking church. Today on the Reality Bible Special, Pastor Peter Jenkins and I discuss the Church of Christ. Indeed, this is the Reality Bible Special, getting into God's Word and getting God's Word into us, uh, looking at the Bible and some of the ethics, some of the concepts of the Bible. And I'm joined in the studio today by Pastor Peter Jenkins. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today on the Reality Bible Special. We're going to be looking at the church. Peter Jenkins, in your definition, what is the church? My definition of the church is probably not the definition that most people would give because If I was to carry out a survey, and I have done this, asking people what they think of a church, of the church, what is a church, nearly every time the answer comes back, it's a building. Yes. That's exactly what people think of when they think of it, it's a building, because they associate church with the building on the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Or up the street or whatever. And then from that... It goes from a building to a denomination. So what the next question I would I then asked, as I'm asking the questions, I'm getting asked questions. Well, what kind of a church? Yeah. <laughs> Is it a Methodist church, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, Congregational, Pentecostal, Assemblies <laughs> of God, Elim, yeah. New Wine, Old Wine, whichever wine you want to drink, I don't know. <laughs> but what kind of a church? Yeah. So we go from it's a building now to what kind? Is it a big building, a small building, a new building, an old building? Has it got stained glass windows, pipe organ? Has it got drums? Has it got keyboards? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a church? Yes. So people have a a set idea in their minds of the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we go back to the early church, go back to the early Christians, they didn't have any buildings. So if we were to ask the question then, they wouldn't have the problem of it's a building because yeah. they didn't have any buildings. Yeah. They met from house to house daily, breaking the bread, fellowship, and they went out sharing the good news. And so... Over a passage of time, the answer to the question has changed, but the reality has not changed. Because when we consider what the Bible tells us the church is, the Bible actually says he is the head of the body, which is the church. Mm -hmm. So the Bible defines the church as a body, whereas we've made it a building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the early church, for 300 years, they had no buildings. Then suddenly, here comes Constantine, who wants to make Christianity, the official religion of Rome, replace the Jews. That's the idea. That was his intention. Hmm. So now there's only one way that you could ever come to God, and that's through that man-made organization, hmm. which needed big buildings. Hmm. And they have big buildings, that's a sure fact. Hmm. Very big buildings. Is that a church? The answer, in my opinion, is no. Because as I began to consider... And then I have to ask myself, okay, so if the church is a body and Christ is the head of the body, is my body a church? This is a question that needs to be asked now. Everybody listening Mm -hmm. suddenly switch around now from looking externally 
at a church, mm -hmm. looking internally at the church. Mm -hmm. So your body is the church because the Holy Spirit has made your body his temple. Mm -hmm. Now, if the Holy Spirit is living inside you and Christ is the head of your life, guess what? You are a walking church. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Hello. <laughs> it's true. Yes. We now, of course, we need each other. We can't. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't live in isolation. We need each other. That's part of the reason for this program. That we yeah. we're having church now. Mm. We're individuals, but we belong. We're all spokes in a wheel, but we belong to each other. We need each other. We need encouragement, fellowship, prayer. I need you to pray for me. You need me to pray for you. Mm -hmm. We need each other. Mm -hmm. We're not called to live in isolation, but when it hit me that actually Holy Spirit has made my body his temple, mm -hmm. Christ is the head of my life, I'm a walking church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> some of us are all large churches, some of us are not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some of us some are big churches, some are little, some I'm a little church, I'm five shacks. foot six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody described the church as the only organization that exists for the benefit of non members. Yes. Amen. Once the church becomes so inward looking, that's I've seen it. I've been serving the Lord sixty years this summer, wow. and once I and once the church becomes inward looking, then it's all about them. So now it's the colour of the carpet. You can't move those pews because my <laughs> uncle put them in. You can't move the pulpit because my great grandfather built that. It's mm. all about them. Now it's mm. all preservation, right? Mm. I've seen it so many times. I was preaching at a big. <laughs> I was preaching at a big rally in Wales. And uh, in Wales, we have these big churches, big chapels, we call them, with balconies. So they, you know, they're big buildings and you can get a lot of people in them. And it was <laughs> packed. The walls were perspiring. It was so hot, even the walls were perspiring. <laughs> right. Sweaty walls. So I'm about to preach. So I took my tie off oh. because it's boiling hot. I've got no jacket. I took my tie off. I'm boiling hot. So the deacon of the church came up to me and he said, brother... Now, you need to know when some people say brother like that, they don't mean brother, right? But he said, he said, he said, brother, you're not going to preach without a tie on, are you? <laughs> it's true. I said, it's boiling hot in this place, like, you know. Yeah. But brother, that wood, he's pointing at the pulpit, that yeah. wood, he said, it's consecrated ground. Oh, my. So I said, it looks like a bit of wood to me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I got up and I defied him. I didn't put a tie on, but I did preach a rather naughty message, which was the anointing is in the tie. <laughs> <laughs> the ties that bind. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just a stupid example, yeah. right? Of how the church has completely lost its identity. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a living body. Absolutely. It doesn't don't. depend yeah. upon th Yes, we have to have rules and regulations, but they've got to be in the scriptures, mm. not made by men. Mm. That's another religion. Religion is a load of rules made up by men that nobody can keep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these church buildings actually symbolize or represent the uh, the de denomination, I hate that word, the, uh, you know, the organization of the particular thread of Christianity. And I'm thinking of the great big cathedrals uh, in the world which are ornate and beautiful in their uh, architecture. And they are beautiful buildings. And then there are are these massive auditoriums, high-tech auditoriums that some churches have, but they represent two threads of Christianity just in the shape of the building, would you say? Yeah, and, you know, the, you, when we think, we go back to the Reformation and we think that how that took place, which, thank God, it did. Um, but then out of that, you see, the thing is, this is the big challenge when I sit back and I begin to reflect why do we take communion the way we take communion? This is an interesting question, right, mm. as we, how we operate. We take communion the way we do because the way the Anglican Church takes it. So if you go into an Anglican Church and see the way they take communion, it's very similar to the way we take it in a nonconformist church, whether it's a Pentecost or whatever, but Baptist, we take it mm. very similar to... Now, why do the Anglicans take communion like that? Because of the way the Catholics take it. <laughs> it's true. Yes. You go into a Catholic church and see the way that they take the communion, and then you go into an Anglican church, then you go into a nonconformist church. So we're doing this because they do that, because they do that. Isn't this just tradition? Well, so it reminds me of the story, right, of, of uh, <laughs> a young couple that got married and um, and every week the, when they went to cook the, the Sunday roast, the wife cut a piece of meat off and threw it in the bin. And they, they hadn't been married very long, so the husband didn't like to say too much because he thought, well, 
I can't understand that. It's a strange thing she does. Like, But anyway, the, there was a lovely dinner, so I'll eat the dinner and shut my mouth. Yeah. So <laughs> after about three months, she got a bit fed up because like every week they buy meat and she's cutting a bit off, throwing it in the bin. So he said to her, why do you do that, you know? She says, well, to be honest with you, I don't know. But my mother always did it. <laughs> he said, your mother always did it. So they, he said, I'm going to ask your mother. So they went to his, his mother. Why did, did you always cut a piece of meat off? She said, well, as you actually asked me, yes, I did. Well, why did you do that? She says, to be absolutely honest, I never thought about why. I, I, I don't know why I did it. I did it because my mother did it. So they go to Granny, who's about 98 and partly deaf, and they got to shout at her and everything. <laughs> Granny! <laughs> why did you cut a piece of meat off and throw it in the bin? She said, because the saucepan wasn't big enough. <laughs> tradition, tradition. And nobody knew why they were, but because they always had, nobody questioned it. Yes. So then we... I know that sounds crazy, I know, but there's so much like that, you know. Mm. But all I'm saying is that... Please, whatever you do, and whoever's listening to this program, whatever you do in your church, ask yourself why. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm, quite mm -hmm, healthy to mm -hmm. ask, why do we do mm -hmm. this? Is it in the Bible? It, why do we do it? Well, because we've always done it. Yes. Is that a good enough reason? Yeah. Those are the last sort of seven words of the dying church. We never did it like this before. Mm -hmm. And so, be, you Apostle. know, if you keep doing the same thing, yeah. you're not going to get a different result. They keep getting the same thing. You're going to get the same result. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, well, thank God we're not knocking denominations. We're not knocking. We're really not. But no, but the question is this: You see, when I look at it, is I've studied this, and I thought, when we look at the different different main groups of church, look at the Baptist Church. They brought a great emphasis on water baptism. Do we believe in that? Yes, important. Look at the Salvation Army. They brought a great emphasis on social care. In fact, in the UK, the second largest providers of social care after the government is the Salvation Army. Wow. That's a remarkable thing in That's itself. That's incredible. It is. So they brought a great emphasis on that. The Pentecostals brought a great emphasis on Holy Spirit. The problem is we've stayed apart. Mm. If we bring all those together so we got one cake, it would be wonderful. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Well, we're talking about the church today on the Reality Bible st uh, Series. What is the church, the body of Christ? And we're going to be picking up on that in just a minute. Uh, Peter Peter Jenkins, Pastor Peter Jenkins today with me in the studio, talking about the body of Jesus after this. You're listening to The Reality, produced by Sure Reality, a listener-supported radio ministry. We depend on the generous gifts of our listener to produce this program. You can help reach millions of folks with the sure reality of the message of Jesus by becoming a sure reality vision partner. To partner with us, please visit the website surereality.net and click on Become a Vision Partner. Hello to you if you've just joined us. I'm Dudley Anderson. So good to have your company. This is The Reality, a half hour talk show talking about the reality of Jesus Christ. Today on The Reality, we're featuring a special. We call it the Reality Bible Special, getting into the Word of God and getting God's Word into us. Today, I speak with Pastor Peter Jenkins, and I ask him the question, what is the church? So far, we've found out that the true church is not a building. Many, many beautiful, ornate buildings have been built over the centuries in honor of God, and it's a spiritual home for people who worship God. However, we've seen that the actual church is not any of these buildings. The church is not a cathedral, a tabernacle, a temple, a state-of-the-art auditorium, a chapel, or a shack. The church of Jesus Christ is comprised of the dear people who know him as Lord and Savior and seek to serve him in unity. In fact, the true temple of the Holy Spirit is the physical body of every Christian believer. The scriptures expound this thought to imply that the body of Christ, the church, is an organism much like our own human bodies. So let's find out more as we chat with Pastor Peter Jenkins today on The Reality Bible Special. This is The Reality Bible Special. With me in the studio is Pastor Peter Jenkins and we're talking about the church. The reality, the title reality comes from Colossians 2 verse 17. Peter that uh, says, under the anointing of God's Spirit as Paul Penn scripture, he says, these things we face, these traditions of man, we've been mm. talking a lot about tradition, are a shadow. Mm. The reality, however, is found in Christ, Jesus. Uh, 
Now, he also goes on, Paul, by the anointing of God's Spirit, goes on in Corinthians to talk about the body, the human body, as representing yeah. the church. So I've got fingers, I've got a nose, I've got um, something that, that I really, uh, that made an impression on me uh, talking about this once was the, the little hairs in my ear, Peter, that detect sound. If I didn't have those little hairs in my ear, my world would fall apart. Yeah. The tiniest part mm. of my body, mm. every part in this body has a part to play. And that's so true. And, and we, we, we sometimes forget that. Because very often it's the hidden parts of the body which are the most important part. It's not the person who stands up on the pulpit that everybody can see. Mm. But it's, uh, Billy Graham talked one time, you know, he discovered that there was this old lady who would find out where he was holding his crusades. Mm. She would book herself into a hotel and pray all the way through the crusades. Wow. Now, he was the visible part of the body. He didn't even know about her, but God did. Absolutely. And she was praying. How many souls were won because of her prayers? Everybody saw him, the visible part of the yeah. body. But the invisible parts of the body are even more important yeah. in order that the body can function. I remember some years ago that um, I met a young guy when I was living in Wales who had just come out of a borstal. He had no family. He had a, he'd had a terrible life. And somebody in the church where we attended took him in to, to share with them, to live with them. No, they lived up on the side of a mountain because Wales is very hilly, very mountainous. They had a small holding. So he decided he would keep some chickens there. So they were quite happy with that. So these chickens were running everywhere, all up the mountain and mm. everything. <laughs> and then he decided that he would kill all the chickens and sell them for Christmas so that he would get some income. <laughs> right. That was good. So I took a day off work to help him prepare the chickens for Christmas. Many of those chickens were going to go into the ministry because the pastor and some of the elders had bought them, so they were, mm -hmm. the chickens were going literally going into the ministry. <laughs> so, so my mother ordered one and everybody else. So anyway, I've never killed a chicken in my life. Yeah. When I arrived, he forgot to tell me they were free range, right? Now, yeah. these chickens <laughs> could them. tell. They knew what date it was, <laughs> and they were not as happy about Christmas as we were. Yes. Some of them were up in trees. They were everywhere, like looking at us as if to say, if you want us, you've got to come and get us, like, you know. <laughs> well, eventually, oh, after a few hours, I managed to catch one. And I, I've never cut a chicken's head off in my life, and I hope I never have to again. Mm. But I, I cut his head off. And that chicken taught me something. Yeah. which is very remarkable because, you see, I've never been to Bible school, so I have to, God has to teach me things in simple ways, right? Mm -hmm. I don't understand Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and all that. God has to speak to me in very simple ways that I can understand. And God showed me something that I've never forgot about the church from that chicken. Now, <laughs> it can only happen to me. I cut the chicken's head off, and do you know what, Deadly? The chicken ran away. <laughs> it ran away, flapping its wings, and it ran away. Now, there's two things I learned about that. Because I cut his head off, the chicken couldn't see where it was going. <laughs> and it, it didn't get very far, right? Because it, it ran out of energy after not too long. But it still managed to function even without a head. Wow. Come on. I think I've got a simple application there. <laughs> a lot of churches can still function even without a head. <laughs> they can run their programs they can do all their things, they have great music, but they have, But are they functioning like that chicken could still run, mm. even with, a, with his head cut off? Mm. Are they functioning without a head? I've mm. never forgot that. And I pray to God that I don't function in my personal church, my body, my mm. life without the head. Because mm. the moment I do, I might still be active, I might still be, but I'd, I'll make no more progress than that chicken did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm powerful running around like a headless chicken well that's the expression that's right that's a, that's the exact expression like a headless chicken mm -hmm. and and sad to say you know i remember somebody saying to me once because uh, every church has different ways of appointing pastors and so this one church i was speaking to them how do you appoint your pastor oh we bring him for a view that's what they call it, a view. A view? A view of what? Like, what's he going to look at, you know? Is he wearing a tie? A view of wearing a tie, yeah. So anyway, they had him with a view. And, and I spoke to them on the Monday, and I said, and how did it go yesterday with the prospective pastor? Oh, wonderful. I said, oh, I'm really pleased. He looked wonderful. This is what they said to me. Mm. He looked wonderful in the pulpit, and he had a lovely white shirt on. Mm. 
I thought, my goodness me, right? So they give him a call. They called him to be the pastor because he looked wonderful in the pulpit mm. and he had a lovely white shirt on. Mm. So another church, I asked them the same, how do you appoint your pastor? Well, we take a vote of the members. And uh, if we have a two-thirds majority, then that will be the decision. And I never forgot this. And this dropped in my mind. I said, you know, you can have a two-thirds majority, but it won't give you a two-thirds anointing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The appointment of a man is not necessarily the appointment of God. Mm -hmm. And once once we forget who the head is, and yes, we have to have management in the church. Of course we do. We have to have leaders. Of course we do. We need pastors. We need elders because that's biblical. And we need deacons. That's Bible. Mm -hmm. But the moment they replace the head, that's mm -hmm. the difference. Mm -hmm. They must be under the head. Mm -hmm. The moment they replace the head, you haven't got a church. So is the pastor the head? No. Do you know how I describe myself? Somebody asked me that question once. They said, how do you describe yourself? I said, I'm a sheepdog. <laughs> they said, what do you mean you're a sheepdog? I said, well, if you ever see a shepherd with a dog, the shepherd will blow his whistle. And that dog will understand every single sound that whistle makes. I won't understand it. I won't even hear them because some of the pictures are so high, only the dog can hear it. Mm. But every single call from that shepherd, run, stop, left, right, go here, go there, mm -hmm. that dog understands. Mm -hmm. The sheepdog carries out the wishes of the shepherd. Mm -hmm. There's only one shepherd. Mm -hmm. I'm yes. happy to be a sheepdog. The head of the church. I'm happy to be a sheepdog. <laughs> Jesus is the head yes. of the church. He's the shepherd. Yes, indeed. I'm an under-shepherd, yes, but I'm a sheepdog. <laughs> I'm happy to be a sheepdog. Fantastic. Now, talking about pastors, you know, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, we read the so-called five-fold ministry, uh, if I can get them all together, apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Mm. Um, so those are, we're talking about body parts. Yes, those of are parts yeah, yeah. of the body. Yeah. So who of those should actually be the manager? The role of all of those yeah. is to bring the whole body to function yes. so that every part fulfills its function that's the it's preparing everybody to fulfill their function now in that in that setup i don't know i don't know what church where all those all those gifts are in operation i really i really don't i mean people call themselves apostles it's quite a popular thing he's an apostle mm. of, but an apostle actually actually have a encounter with the risen christ like i mean for paul to be an apostle he had to have a damascus road experience so the whole title apostle needs to go back to the biblical definition of it, really. Mm -hmm. But we need teachers. Of course we do. Mm -hmm. We need evangelists. We need pastors. We need all these gifts operating. But never forget the reason for them mm -hmm. is to prepare every single part of the body. Mm -hmm. Some churches um, call the leader or the overseer of the yeah. church, they call him the head elder or the lead elder. The and lead that, elder, and yeah. that man might not be a pastor yeah. as a shepherd, but he may be a teacher. In fact, an evangelist. Yeah. And, and an evangelist doesn't make a very good pastor. You know, A prophet doesn't make a very good pastor, no, but no. he can still nevertheless oversee the, the church. Yeah, I like that, that, that model. And every, I like the model, too, as providing everyone, everyone is under authority. Mm. That's the important Structure, thing. We must yeah. we must submit to each other. You know, yeah, absolutely. the moment the moment that one of those becomes outside of accountability, mm. outside of submission to the authority, that's when you mm. got a problem. Just um, last thought, Peter. Our time is nearly up. Talking about authority, some of the problems that I've experienced personally in church are criticisms and and backbiting and <laughs> uh, you know so-called church politics. Have you ever experienced that? <laughs> Is that hysterical uh, laughter? Have I ever experienced that? <laughs> that nervous laughter. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, God has blessed me with a... See, there's, there's two kinds of memory, okay? There's a good, bad memory and a bad, good memory. And let me explain what I mean by that. Now, a good, bad memory means you've got a good memory to remember all the bad things that have happened. Mm. But a bad, good memory means you can't remember all the good things that have happened. Mm. <laughs> if, I, if I allow my good, bad memory to kick in, I could write a book on 100 reasons why you should never be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Spurgeon said to his students, you only ever go into the ministry if there's no possible way you can avoid it, right? <laughs> because if anybody goes into it for glamour, it doesn't last very Absolutely. long. I had a very, very, very bad accident when I was in my early 20s, and it's another story for another day, but somebody died, and I went through a terrible time. I nearly had a 
a breakdown. Mm. One person came to me to see me every night. One person. He wasn't a Christian. He was somebody I'd been to school with. He had nothing to say to me, but he was. He came there. And I'll say this to everyone now. Sometimes you don't know what to say. Sometimes just ring up and say, I don't know what to say, mm. but I want you to know I'm praying for you. That will mean more than you could ever imagine. Mm. Very often we don't know what to say. We don't have answers. I don't have answers to everything. Mm. The older I get, I've got less answers than I had when I was younger. <laughs> I mean, that's a really clever thing, isn't it? I had all the answers when I was 20. <laughs> now I've got all the questions. That's the truth of it. Yeah. I don't have all the answers, but sometimes we need to know. We need to hear a voice of someone. We need a mm. phone call. Mm. Just to say, I don't have anything to say, but I'm praying for you. Mm. That means more than anything. And we can, we can be... A, a bigger blessing than we'll ever understand if we mm. could only be willing to do mm. that. Amen. And that's love. And there is a scripture that says, let love bind us we together. Bind, yeah, exactly. Uh, love is like the collagen mm. in the human body. The mm. church is called the body of Christ. Mm. And in the human body, there is this sticky tissue called collagen. It sticks my skin to Amazing. my flesh. Yeah. It keeps my <laughs> bones together. That's love in the body of Christ. It is. Peter Jenkins, thank you for joining us today in my the Reality faith. Bible Series. For the best part of the last half hour, right here on the Reality Bible Special, we've been talking with Pastor Peter Jenkins, discussing the church. What is the church? Now, as we have well seen, the church is not a building. It doesn't comprise a building. It comprises the body, the people who make up that church. We are the body of Christ. The body is the church. And so when we meet together in a building, we're meeting together for unity in love. I'd like to leave us with a word from the Word of God, reading from Colossians chapter 3 from verse 12 to 15. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so also must you forgive and listen to verse 14. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. The peace of God rules in our hearts as we bind together in meekness, humility, kindness, patience, and indeed love. As we said in closing, love is like the collagen, the connective tissue that holds the body of Jesus together. If you're involved in a church right now, I'd like to encourage you to give it all, give it all for Jesus in love, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. You've been listening to The Reality with me, Dudley Anderson. The Reality is a half-hour talk show talking about the reality of Jesus Christ. To find out more and how you can support us, please visit our website, surereality.net. The Reality is produced by Sure Reality, a listener-supported radio ministry. Don't forget you can drop me an email, dudley at surereality.net. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, keep your eyes on Jesus and walk in the sure reality of Christ. Sure.